Hello there, welcome to this edition of Global Business Africa. In the next half hour, we'll make a speed run through all the key business news stories you need to know about from across the African continent. Here's what's coming up. Nigeria's economic pain on a day when the Naira hit yet another record low. We'll have the details. Ethiopia, Egypt, Sudan, they're all talking about the Grand Renaissance Dam. And farmers to win big in South African breweries' new strategy of making eco-friendly beer. As we've done several times so far this week, let's start in Nigeria. Foreign currency dealers stopped trading the currency after the central bank over there changed rules on exactly how much dollars banks can hold. Now, the CBN's latest directive aims to, it says, limit speculation in the Naira. After the announcement, however, the market registered its displeasure. The Naira plunged to a new record of about 188 to the dollar. That adds to its 13% decline against the greenback so far this quarter. That's the worst performance among 24 African currencies after Malawi's Kwacha. Investors are dropping Nigerian assets as the outlook for Africa's biggest oil producer worsened, with Brent crude prices almost halving since June this year. The Central Bank of Nigeria's Deputy Governor, Sarah Alade, said the regulator will be meeting currency traders to talk more about the bank circular on the new rules. By 11 this morning on Thursday in Lagos, there were 12 trades in the Naira, compared to Wednesday's figure of 101. Now, Nigeria, of course, has less than three months to go to its general elections, and it's facing a fairly potent cocktail of economic issues. Its finance minister has already cut the 2015 growth forecast due to the plunge in global oil prices that happened earlier today, uh, rather earlier this week, and a sharp fall in the value of the Naira as well. But all investors are asking ahead of the elections in February is, a, is for a stable government that will iron out the current challenges facing Africa's biggest economy. About eight months ago, Nigeria officially overtook South Africa to become Africa's biggest economy with a revised gross domestic product of about $500 million. That was good news for investors who seemed bullish on the economic outlook of the oil-producing nation. A stark contrast from today's Nigeria, the West African country is suffering from a plummeting Naira currency, insecurity, steep budget cuts, corruption scandals, diving oil prices and austerity measures that are not playing out too well with the Nigerians. This as it heads to the polls on February 2015. I blame the economic system of Nigeria, not the president, but I blame those ones who see it as a, play, a, a, a way of getting something from the masses, like those who stock dollars and they are willing to sell it now to, in order for them to um, kind of sponsor their political ambitions. The increase is quite unprecedented. I, don't, I can't believe, you know, and I think the, um, it's the very first time that dollar has gone up to 192 Naira. It's, quite is is mad everybody is crying and complaining and it really affected a lot of things when the central bank devalued the naira last month to save foreign reserves the impact was felt instantly on the streets nigeria imports 80 percent of what it consumes the devaluation of the naira has increased the cost of raw materials by at least 20 percent because most manufacturers at the moment are being denied access to the uh, retail Dutch auction system, which makes it possible for them to get uh, cheaper dollars at, I think, about 163 or 68, as the case may be. Um, so consequently, if they are buying their dollar requirements for imports at 180 or thereabouts, you can expect that there will be at least a 20% increase in production cost. And since the manufacturers are not philanthropists or charitable organizations, they will have to pass on this increased cost to the consumer. Current President Goodluck Jonathan faces main opposition contender ex-military leader Muhammadu Buhari on the polls. Buhari is likely to benefit from a perception that Nigeria was not prepared for the energy price shock because so much oil revenues have been lost through corruption under Jonathan's administration. But what investors are actually looking out for is a transparent administration that is looking to diversify revenue streams and cut luxury spending. Penina Karibe, CCTV. 
Sketches some reactions to the events in Nigeria as far as the Naira and the U.S. dollar trading is concerned. Mary Bema joins us now with the latest reactions and analysis from London. Um, Mary, what reactions are you getting to the CBN's uh, ban on bank dollar holdings drawn uh, from investors on your end? Mm, Rama, investors are very worried. You know, we're seeing this play out today while the measures prevent banks from taking a view on the Naira's direction for now. It might not be effective in the long run. The problem is that investors know the Naira is heavily linked to oil. So unless that market stabilizes, Rama, the currency will continue to uh, depreciate. Analysts say that we could see Nigerian banks collectively sell more than $200 million worth of foreign currency. We saw a similar situation in Kenya back in 2011. The central bank tried to provide hard currency to specific sectors and try to shore up the exchange rate. It didn't help that Kenya's exports, of course, couldn't earn enough to pay for its oil imports. This time around with Nigeria, it's really a question as to whether or not we can see the government diversify the country's economy beyond commodities like oil and natural gas while trying to maintain the Naira. The common thought on this end among investors is that this move uh, was a desperate attempt really to bring relief even if it's short-term relief. Indeed. Now the Naira has traded so far this year in a band of between 157 to 188 Naira to the dollar in the last 52 weeks. And all we've battered this topic to death but it's worth asking once again what's the forecast for the Naira in 2015? I've been asking analysts and investors the same thing today. You know, given the Naira's strong ties to oil prices, some are questioning whether or not the government's earlier forecast will actually f hold for next year. Even this week, we were hearing Nigeria's finance ministry reiterating the government's benchmark for its 2015 budget with crude stabilizing at $65 per barrel. The central bank has also raised interest rates and repeatedly intervened in currency markets by selling U.S. dollars in a bid to sort of prop up the Naira. But so so far, it's not biting. At the end of the day, though, analysts know that oil and other commodities account for about 96% of export revenue and about 80% of government revenue. It will not be easy to diversify, especially with things like poor prices and bloated government spending. Indeed. We'll have to leave it there for the time being. Uh, Mary Bema there live in London. Fairly lively debate taking place, of course, in response to what's happening today online as well. Some asking if this is essentially just capital controls by another name. Let's focus on Brent crude. Uh, prices were up about 3% to almost $63 a barrel in Thursday trading. The U.S. of course is scaling back supplies to the market this week. Benchmark prices, Brent crude and WTI mainly, have fallen by over 40% since June in the wake of a supply glut from the U.S. and weaker global demand, mostly in China and the EU. Now, earlier this week, Brent crude had hit a five-year low, $58.50. Losses accelerated earlier in the quarter after OPEC decided not to cut production targets on the 27th of November. However, it now seems that prices have fallen to levels which threaten future oil production, and that has given some traders pause and forced some energy firms to cut investments in new output as well. Right, away from uh, oil and commodity matters, Ethiopian and Sudanese officials are in Egypt to discuss the controversial Renaissance Dam. Ethiopia is building that enormous $4.8 billion facility to generate electricity, which it does badly need, despite concerns from Egypt about the loss of access to Nile water, on which it heavily relies. Wazir Hamsin has the details. The experts from Ethiopia, Sudan and the host nation Egypt are meeting in Al-Azhar, a religious institution to discuss the impact the Renaissance Dam project will have on all three countries. There have been concerns about the construction of the project along the Nile River, Egypt's main source of water. We are not building this dam only for today, only for Ethiopians. Primarily, we want to use energy to alleviate our poverty. But not only that to use together with our Egyptian brothers, Sudanese brothers. And this dam will be beneficial for all of us. Since we are the estuary nation, the last nation before the river meets the sea, we cannot harm our brothers in Ethiopia, and they cannot also harm Egyptians. Ethiopians will never prefer electricity at the expense of Egyptians going thirsty. Egypt 
During the last two meetings, the three countries agreed to produce a list of seven farms, out of which only one would be selected to conduct studies on the project. Once complete, the $4.2 billion infrastructure will have the capacity to generate around 6,000 megawatts of electricity for Ethiopia. That could bring an end to frequent power outages in the Horn of Africa nation and could also lead to exportation of energy to neighboring countries. The dam is due to be completed by July 2017 and will be the biggest hydroelectric power station in Africa. Wazir Hamsin, CCTV. Now then, with respect to the question of uh, Egypt, we'll of course be moving on to the question of the market. Some interesting data coming through across the board today. Recovery in Nigeria and in South Africa. JC Allshare uh, index up by 3.98%. Also recovery apparently coming through in Egypt. There was quite a bit of a sell-off in Middle Eastern markets. The indices in Dubai, uh, Saudi Arabia falling by over 7 percentage points. That recovery of course is booing the market in Egypt. Looking at the turbulence in African skies, next we'll be discussing the outlook for the continent aviation sector in 2015. Food security is a major challenge for most African nations, yet agriculture is a backbone of these economies. But with technologies like hydroponics, there is hope of food availability all year round. Twelve minutes into the hour, you're still watching Global Business Africa. Now, after a year of preparation, the first leg of Kenya's standard gauge rail line from Mombasa to Nairobi is finally being constructed. Contractors started the work at the beginning of December. Now, this rail line is the first to adopt Chinese standards outside of the world's second largest economy. Kenya's standard gauge railway will connect its port city of Mombasa to its capital, Nairobi. It spans more than 480 kilometers southeast to northwest. It's the first international trunk railway outside of China to adopt Chinese technology, Chinese management, and Chinese electromechanical equipment. The construction of the Mombasa Nairobi SGR is of crucial significance to the improvement of the East Africa railway network. We all know that the current logistics of goods from Mombasa to the inland of East Africa mainly rely on road transportation and meter gauge railways. The transportation capacity is very limited. Therefore, the construction of the railway will greatly improve the condition of transportation. Based on the gauge standard of 1,435 millimeters, it mainly serves as a freight line but also operates passenger services with 33 stations across the line. The government of Kenya is building the Mombasa Nairobi Railway on loan with a contract amount of $3.8 billion. The China Road and Bridge Corporation is the contractor. It started construction on the railway line, which is divided into eight sections. Now, the road is 7.7 .7 meters and it connects with gravels. We built the railway according to the Chinese standard railway gauge of 1,435 millimeters. This is a single line railway in the very middle of us. That means this is where we lay the rails in the future. Yes, the location for laying the rail. More than 100 kilometers of the Mombasa Nairobi standard gauge railway will go through the Savon National Park. In an effort to conserve the natural habitat, Chinese contractors are building animal passages along the railway line to allow for migration. The animal passage comprises of three pieces. Each piece is 24 meters in length and about 8 meters in height. This height guarantees that all animals in the park, including the tallest giraffe, can go through the passage. 
The animal passage not only affects the height of this area, perhaps we will need to increase the fill for several kilometers around here. This increases our construction cost, but we believe this is what we must do. During the peak of the construction, more than 30,000 people will be employed. Technical skills will be transferred and it will contribute an average of 1.5% of GDP growth every year. Workers for Kenya create nearly 30,000 job opportunities. The construction of this railway should be the first project of Chinese standard, Chinese design, Chinese construction technology, Chinese equipment, and Chinese operation and management in the future. It is a symbolic project of the whole industrial chain. The construction of the project accords with the national strategy of going global, especially if it brings along the going global progress of the whole industrial chain of Chinese equipment. It is of great significance. The standard gauge railway is expected to be completed in 2018. Wazir Khamsin, CCTV. Right, on to transportation matters at least 30,000 feet straight up. The International Air Transport Association is forecasting a profitable 2015 for the sector. It says the industry outlook is improving as the global economy recovers and it's forecasting an average 3.2% profit margin for airlines. Now, the last time the profit margin came close to IATA's projection was for the next year was around 2010, just 3.1% back then. In What's Hot Tonight, Voldy Kurelsa takes us through what else you airline passengers can expect next year. Air travel will be slightly cheaper in 2015. That's according to the International Air Transport Association. The industry body represents around 250 airlines across the world and accounts for 84% of global air traffic. It expects fares to be 5.1% lower in 2015 compared to this year, as passengers benefit from a drop in oil prices and sustained global economic growth. IATA also predicts the airline industry will report a record $25 billion profit next year, as net profitability across all regions increase. But the outlook isn't quite as rosy for Africa's airlines. The continent is the weakest performing region as it has been for the past two years. Airlines are just breaking even in 2014. IATA expects profits to be at $200 million in 2015. That represents almost $3 per passenger. Compared to the strongest performing region, North America, where net profit per passenger is at just over $15. IATA says this is a significant improvement from three years earlier. And while Africa's airlines might struggle to catch up, the airline body says it is improving. That, however, isn't the complete picture. You see, IATA is forecasting yields per passenger for African airlines to rise to $2.51 in 2015. 2014's figure was uh, a little more dismal, just 26 US cents. Now that figure compares poorly to other regional average, from yields of over $15 a passenger to North America to about $8 a passenger in the Middle East. Now to figure out what the weak spots in African innovation are and how airlines and governments can overcome them, earlier today I spoke to IATA's Anthony Comcho. The fact that the fuel price has dropped is, is certainly a, a positive for the industry. Um, but in order for that to be reflected uh, in, in the actual cost of the airlines, it will depend on the situation of individual airlines in terms of their hedging positions, etc. Uh, I can't really comment on the position of individual airlines, um, but certainly for that drop in fuel prices to work it th its way through the system will take some time. Indeed. What sort of projections, what sort of numbers are you working with in t as far as projecting how low aviation fuel might drop to? Um, well, at the, the price of crude oil, uh, we're looking at $85 a barrel for this coming year, which is the consensus forecast. Um, that would mean about $99 a barrel for jet fuel. Um, mm. There's a slight premium that's attached to that. Indeed. Um, let's focus on something else that was also in that report. The value of aviation is, quote, not well understood by governments. What exactly did IATA mean by this statement? Um, well, you know, aviation is a critically important industry to our world. Um, 
First, in terms of its own employment and the economic activity that it generates, it, it's somewhere around 58 million jobs and uh, $2.4 trillion worth of economic activity. Um, in Africa, that's about 6.9 million jobs and $80 billion worth of business that's supported directly um, by the industry and, and associated tourism activities. Um, and I guess what, what we find is that governments sometimes don't understand uh, the value of aviation in terms of how it drives businesses. Um, it would be very difficult to find a modern business that isn't in some way uh, benefiting from the connectivity that's created by aviation, whether it's through um, you know, business contacts that are fulfilled by aviation or uh, cargo that's delivered by aviation. The industry delivers some 50 million tons of cargo every year. Um, or just the fact that, that people are moving around the world, exchanging ideas, um, and doing business together. And so when, when it comes to governments, oftentimes they see aviation as a soft target for taxation, um, rather than an industry that should be um, you know, somehow uh, s not supported financially, but um, have, have created an environment in which the industry can be successful. Indeed. You also spoke about in the same report about inefficient airspace management and you attributed billions of dollars in losses to this particular problem in Europe alone. To what extent is it a problem as well in African airspace? Um, well, in, in general, um, the more efficiently that an, air, an aircraft can operate, um, the better it is for the industry, um, better in terms of its environmental performance, better in terms of um, you know how, how it gets people from um, point A to point B on time um, and and burning the, the least amount of fuel possible. Um, as you rightly pointed out, in Europe it's, a, it's billions of dollars in cost to the industry simply because uh, the airspace is fragmented. Um, in the case of Africa, there's actually a very good example, which is the SECNA, which covers uh, primarily the French-speaking countries of Africa um, and, and manages them as, as a single airspace. To a large extent, that's what we're trying to, to achieve in Europe, is that holistic look at, at um, um, air, air traffic. Um, now, of course, in Africa, the traffic uh, is, is relatively light, um, but still there are some issues in terms of, of routines, military airspace, etc., which we are working with governments to try and sort out. All right. Uh, moving on to a question of commodities here. It seems this, the, the bounce we saw a little earlier with regard to crude prices, the steam has essentially been taken right of that. Uh, they're falling once again, a bit of short covering according to Reuters here in early trade. You're looking at uh, Brent crude down to about 60 or so dollars a barrel at the moment. You're crude down to about $55 a barrel yet again. The search for the bottom has resumed. Farmers are winning big in South Africa's breweries a new strategy as it seeks to make eco-friendly beer. Is Asia. Asia means business. Welcome back to the program. You're still watching Global Business Africa. Now, over in South Africa, the continent's largest brewery, South African Breweries, is cultivating eco friendly barley. Now, the firm sells beer right across the world. For the past couple of decades, it's also been investing in better, more efficient local barley production in South Africa. Its latest effort involves producing environmentally responsible beer, as René Del Cam will now explain. Barley is a key ingredient in the beer-making business. Nearly 200,000 tonnes are currently being grown in South Africa's southern and northern Cape provinces. And SAB and the WWF, the World Wildlife Fund, have started collaborating on an initiative called Better Barley, Better Beer, to encourage local farmers to work harder at conserving the environment. 
I think what's unique about it is the way we're going about it um, in terms of sustainable farming. We are not following a strict audit process. Uh, we're actually following a, a buy-in and using farmers to invoke other farmers to farm sustainable. So it's not a big corporate coming and saying you will. It's us helping farmers to help other farmers. That's quite unique. Our road with SA Breweries is one where we focus on, on commodities across the globe and uh, b barley, wheat, uh, cereals, grains have a major uh, impact on our environment. So our partnership with them affords us the opportunity to engage and partner uh, in turn with those who are actually responsible and have the ability to leverage their assets, the natural assets, which are the farmers. They are indeed our custodians of, of uh, our environment. Local barley farmers will be encouraged to practice water reduction decrease their carbon footprints, improve soil health, as well as protect and restore ecosystems. SAB says the Better Barley, Better Beer concept was designed to empower the barley farmer to make the right decisions today to ensure the sustainable production of local barley into the future. But just how will Better Barley lead to better beer. A better tasting beer. Um, that's our brewer's job. Our job is to, to provide the best quality raw materials all the time, consistently. And uh, then our brewers can do great things in terms of our brands. Rene Calm, CCTV, Cape Town. Quick run through the currencies here for you. This is really all about the tragedy of the Naira. A little earlier in the day, there was a fairly confusing edict from the Central Bank of Nigeria which restricted domestic dollar holdings, and banks didn't quite understand it, so they completely refused to give quotes or toiva until the Central Bank governor came out and clarified that, quote, we do not want speculators in this market any longer. When trade did resume, the numbers you're seeing on the screen right now were the result. 188 was at the record low that was hit. It did recover slightly to 187, but for how long the CBN can continue this defense is an open question. Now here's what we're working on for tomorrow's program. We'll be looking at the Nigerian government's attempt to resolve the oil workers strike that's fed partly into today's uh, pricing dynamics on uh, crude oil. We'll also be looking at the potential of potato farming in Mali's agricultural sector. We'll be looking forward to getting our hands dirty in tomorrow's programme. But that's it for this edition of the programme today. Remember, you can send your feedback to globalbusinessafrica at cctv.com. And of course, when we're not on air, Facebook and Twitter are your ports of call. We'll see you over there. The news continues 24-7. I'm Ramanyar.